and congratulations on becoming the next president. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Um, so, well, first of all, I suppose I, I'd like to thank uh, Council and the Society for bestowing upon me this role of president. Um, I'm stepping into some very, very big shoes indeed. I think even Lord Kelvin was a president of the Society for something like several decades um, a long time ago. So that's quite an act to follow. But another uh, capacious pair of field boots that I'm following in is Neil himself. Uh, and uh, he... Uh, following on from Walter, um, has led the society through its council through some really challenging times in the last few years uh, during his presidency. And um, I think we're um, all the stronger for it, in fact. So I'm, I'm very happy to take up the challenge and, and looking forward to it. And I think it's challenging and exciting times ahead. So Neil is our speaker this evening. Uh, and so this slightly delayed pres presidential address I, um, I thought I knew what he was going to talk about, but it's great to have a mystery. Um, so Neil's role uh, as president is really uh, another a, a sort of extension of a role of the promotion of geology to the public, uh, aligned with his own research work and his work uh, in curation at the, at the Hunterian. Um, and it's... Uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see what he has to say about that, but a, but a, but a, a life spent in that role is particularly important, and I think all academic geologists should be making such rapid connections between the research work that they do and it getting out there to the public to see it. Um, so uh, I, I I'm looking forward uh, to your talk now, Neil, whatever it's going to be, uh, and uh, so thanks again for your role as president. Uh, we're all very. Uh, happy with that and uh, off you go the, the floor is yours right thank you uh, for those kind words Simon um, my capacious field boots are only a size eight and a half <laughs> so that so you don't need much of a foot to fill them well mine are 11 <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a squeeze <laughs> um, so uh, I was going to talk to you uh, about the history of the society, because I think that's something that we haven't uh, discussed in any great detail um, as a society. But I think I, I might reserve that um, for the May the 12th Members Night and maybe have something uh, uh, on this society history by, uh, around then. Because the, the history is very interesting, especially its connections to the Hunterian and the University of Glasgow, because uh, I think the vast majority of presidents and members of council in the past have been members of uh, the geology department, uh, either here, Strathclyde or, or elsewhere. So that, that, that would be an interesting uh, discussion to, to have. However, um, as, as you may suspect from the, the slide, I might be talking about Scottish dinosaurs yet again. Um, but is it Scottish dinosaurs or is it Scottish dinosaurs too? Um, so let's have a look. First, first of all, I want to, to just, rather than going straight into dinosaurs, um, because I, as you can see, there's the, the, the emblem, um, the escutcheon of the society up in the, the upper right corner, which is probably blocked by images of, of myself and, and other people, which you can move the the, the images of yourself or myself around a little bit to see the escutcheon. But if you can't, what I'm going to do is uh, show you the escutcheon. Uh, from 1858, this is what the original escutcheon of the society looked like um, in 1858, um, which looks very, very similar to another geological society's uh, uh, symbol, which is the Edinburgh Geological Society. As you can see, there's a belt and there's, uh, there's a hammer in the middle. Um, there's a few, uh, well, there's an Aladdin's lamp or something in the Edinburgh Geological Society. I'm not sure what that represents. Um, but uh, the Glasgow Geological Society has got a, a um, it looks like a, a, a Twizzler or something underneath the, the hammer uh, and pick. <coughs> um, but of course, these, these were both rather than based on, on each other. Obviously, the Edinburgh one came first. Um, 
but it's all based on the order of the garter. So I think the, the societies were thinking of themselves very much of the, as, a, as a knightly society. Um, <clears throat> however, in uh, about 1887, or perhaps before then, we're not entirely sure, the, the escutcheon changed uh, to the, the one that we have on our letterheads now. And uh, I thought I would take a, a few minutes to, to have a look at that and look at the details that you can see on it. <clears throat> now, the escutcheon has changed um, over, the, over the years from the, the, the Order of the Garter style to this one. And then in the 1990s, we, we tried to add a bit of color to it. At least I think it was the 1990s. I do remember um, this being developed, but uh, sadly, we don't seem to have um, a very high resolution image of, of this one. And then it went on to the very much simpler one for the website, because obviously it's a lot easier to read uh, on a website, uh, something that says the Geological Society of Glasgow without all the, the Gothic script. So the uh, escutcheon itself, um, <clears throat> the upper left-hand corner is uh, the Falls of Clyde. Uh, the upper right-hand side is Dumbarton Rock. Um, there's the centre, the symbols of Glasgow, obviously. Um, the bottom right, uh, hammer and satchel for collecting rocks. I presume that's a pebble beach that it's sitting on. And the bottom uh, left is a fault display strata. So it's just a, a dextral fault <clears throat> just to represent the, the geology of, of the area. But you can also see other things around the, the edges, including a fossil gastropod in the bottom left and a fossil crinoid in the bottom right. And I didn't realize this, I think Bill mentioned this to me, but the, the edging of the escutcheon is actually uh, that of a graptolite. And I thought that was very interesting as well. So the, the whole symbolism of the, of the escutcheon just screams uh, geology at us. And obviously Glasgow as well. Now, the, uh, trying, trying to identify the graptolite is a little bit difficult um, because it doesn't seem to <coughs> follow exactly the rules of, uh, of graptolites. Now, if you look at this um, uh, diagram of, of the different styles of graptolites, you can see that it's, <coughs> it's a recurved graptolite, but it's, uh, but it's going the wrong way. It's a pendant upside down recurved. So we need to turn this upside down to get an idea. So if you look at the recurved one, which is upside down, uh, that's the one, if it, if it was more vertical, it would have curved up this way. So that's basically what the graptolite is, but we don't know exactly what the species is other than that it's uh, um, I, uh, <clears throat> something of that sort. Anyway, let's get back to the, the talk that I'm supposed to be giving. <clears throat> Although it's not actually the talk I'm supposed to be giving, it's another talk. I thought I'd, uh, ra rather than talking about uh, stuff that we've done in the past about Scottish dinosaurs, I would talk a little bit about something I did in my summer holidays. So what I did in my summer holidays was I got together with a, a group of other um, fellow dinosaur specialists, and we went to look for dinosaurs. Now, we all know about the dinosaurs on the Isle of Skye, up north of Portree, down near Elgol. Um, perhaps we have heard of the ones around Inverness, and also the ones on the Isle of Egg, which were recently published on. Um, but where we wanted to go was actually the Isle of Muck, <clears throat> so during the summer, I went to the Isle of Muck, which is part of the Hebrides Basin. The, uh, the ones from Inverness are in the Murray Firth Basin, so these dinosaurs probably never talked to each other. Uh, they were a completely different set of dinosaurs, these ones in the Murray Basin to these ones in the Hebrides. But you can see that it, it looks like this whole Hebrides Basin was connected in some way and all these dinosaurs probably are very similar uh, if they're of the similar age. So this is the, the team that we got together. Greg Funston, who did his PhD on, now, 
Pachycephalosaurs. Uh, Paige DiPolo, who did her master's on the dinosaur footprints from the Isle of Skye and is now working on some large mammals, but still maintains an interest in dinosaurs. Um, myself and Davide Fofa uh, from the National Museums of Scotland, um, who's uh, very much interested in plesiosaurs and marine reptiles from uh, the middle Jurassic as well. So we're all kind of Cretaceous Jurassic people all very interested in the dinosaurs of that of that era. So this is us um, going on this field trip and we've all had our um, <clears throat> PCRs and lateral flow tests so we're okay hugging each other. So this is uh, the Isle of Muck um, and uh, the Isle of Muck, the, the, the name of it is a, is a bit of a strange one because I thought well, why, why, why would you call it Muck? Muck doesn't sound like a very attractive name for an island. Um, back in 1785, Boswell, I think, suggested that it probably meant uh, the Isle of Pigs, so the Sow's Island, because muck in Gaelic means um, pig. Um, but the laird at the time decided that uh, that wasn't a very attractive <coughs> name, so he decided that it should be monk, and he tried to convince Samuel Johnson and Boswell that it was actually the Isle of Monk and not the Isle of Muck. Um, because he didn't want to be called the layer of pigs. Um, but in Gaelic, actually, when although it's, it means pig, um, we think it's a, a contraction of the name Mugvara. Uh, so it's Island Nam Mugvara, which means the island of the sea pig. And sea pigs are whales in Gaelic. So it's the Isle of Whales. And of course, if you do go to the Isle of Muck, you'll see the evidence of whales everywhere. This is uh, probably, um, I think, uh, it's a toothed whale, probably um, an orca or something similar to that. So this skull is beside the, uh, <coughs> uh, the visitor center on, on the Isle of Muck. Now, let's have a look at the geology for a second. Uh, there's uh, not much in the way of Jurassic on Isle of Muck, so you'd think that we could probably do this whole thing in a day, um, but it took us a little bit longer than that because you had to walk from uh, uh, Port Moore uh, uh, all the way over to Camish Moor, and <clears throat> it took about an hour and a half walking. Uh, it doesn't seem that far, but uh, in the Scottish summer, it can be very, very difficult to, to walk across uh, muddy fields. Um, in fact, it wasn't muddy at all when we were there. It was a beautiful sunny time <clears throat> and exceedingly hot. In fact, we were more uh, likely to suffer from heat stroke than from uh, uh, foot rot. Now, as you can see, there's only a small amount of uh, Jurassic there. There's, there's a little bit by where it says caves, but we didn't have a look at that because it was too difficult to get to. Uh, the vast bulk of the Jurassic is on the western edge of Camish Moor. And these are Valtos sandstone formation uh, rocks. These ones further up are Duntullum formation and the little bit at the top here are Kumaluic formation. And then we have all the tertiary volcanics uh, elsewhere on the island. So this is, this is all there is basically. There's not very much in the way of um, Jurassic rocks on the island. There's, there's about five, 500 meters worth and that's about it. So this is what it looks like when you get to the, to, uh, the, the bay, Camish Moor. You can see that the, the dikes are very distinctive. They, they shoot off all the way into the sea uh, along uh, the, the bay here and they're, they're very obvious. So you know exactly where you are uh, when, when you get there. Now, <clears throat> obviously, to be able to, to do any mapping there, it's, you obviously need to have some aerial photographs. So this is uh, an image from, um, now, what was it again? Google Earth, I think, this one. Um, and you can see that uh, the photograph they provide us with is at high tide. So you can see absolutely nothing apart from a little bit of Jurassic sediments up here. 
and the resolution is not that great. So it's not very good for um, trying to work out uh, the position of whatever it is that we're going to find. So we needed some base map of some kind. So this is uh, from the PIX4D uh, image of the area. And you can start to see that uh, these, these structures here, which are the dikes, are very obvious and they're, they're shooting off into the, into the sea. And you can start to see some of the Jurassic sediments along the, the coastline here. So this is, this is the main area where we're going to look because there's so much in the way of uh, sediments um, exposed at low tide um, to, to be able to do some research on. So from this, you can see this is PIX4D and what's PIX4D used for? It's used for um, planning uh, drone flights. So this is me planning a drone flight. Uh, 60 meters height, uh, Mavic 2 Pro, and this is the area that we want to map. So we put on top of that, uh, well, first of all, there's the geology uh, superimposed onto, onto that, <clears throat> just so you can see um, that the geology map isn't particularly accurate either in showing you where the, the different structures are. Um, <clears throat> so this is... Uh, the map that we have to produce to, to start the project uh, for the flight. Uh, this is where the drone will start taking images and then it goes along these individual lines taking photographs all the way along and then moves to the next bit and takes photographs all the way along here and then moves to the next and takes photographs and so on and so on uh, covering this entire area. And this is uh, a picture of the drone in flight, just to give you an idea of how the, the drone moves. There it is moving towards the cliffs. And uh, as long as I've got the mapping out properly, it stops just before the cliffs, turns around and moves along. So keep your fingers crossed. It's moving towards the cliffs. And you can hear the sound of oyster catchers getting a bit annoyed that they were flying something else close to them. And it stops just before the cliff, turns around, moves on to the next transect. So that's, that's basically what it's doing. It's taking photographs all the way along these transects and producing hundreds of images of uh, vertically down of the foreshore. Um, <clears throat> so these, this is an example. Here's all the, the images. And when you look at all these images, it's very difficult to make anything out from the images. So you have to combine all the images together. Um, but just to, to let you have a look at the resolution that we can get from this, it's a, it's a lot better than, than you get from Google Earth. Um, you can see all these, uh, these, these are boulders. Uh, they're not pebbles, they, they are boulders on the sediments, but you can see all the cracks in, in the, the sediments, you can see uh, dikes and, and the structure within the dikes to a certain extent as well. There's an offshoot going along there and then it curves around and then there's another dike continuing there. So you can see all sorts of interesting things going on. If we look even closer, we can see uh, even more detail. So you can see <clears throat> little potholes within the, um, within the sediments. You can see the sediment layers very easily. You can see a uh, little interesting structures all over the, the sediments as well. So this is, this is the kind of resolution. You, you can't quite make out the individual barnacles, but you can see barnacles on these rocks. If it was flying at 10 meters, you would see the individual barnacles. And we do fly uh, the, the, the drones at that height as well, just to get uh, very much more precise images <coughs> of, the, of the sediments. So this is the uh, the image, once, once all these images are all stitched together, we can get a very much better uh, idea of what um, is going on in terms of uh, sedimentary layering, where the dikes are more precisely. And uh, once we get really close down into it, we can start to see uh, a lot more detail of the structures of this bay. So these, these are the Jurassic sediments, the vast majority of them being Valtal sandstone formation moving up into the Duntulum up in the top or left here. 
Now, the vast majority of the dinosaur footprints, if you remember back to uh, Scottish Dinosaurs 1, um, <coughs> we, we looked at a lot of the dinosaurs from the Isle of Skye, and the vast majority of them came uh, from, originally were found from the Valtos sandstone formation. So the chances of finding Scottish dinosaur remains from these rocks um, are uh, certainly hopeful. Um, so we, we, we certainly hope because the sediments are from a very similar environment to the ones that we find on the Isle of Skye, that these should uh, have um, dinosaur remains in them. In fact, uh, uh, it was uh, Paige DiPolo who was reading through some old um, literature on uh, these sediments described by, I think it was, uh, was it Harris? Anyway, going back maybe about 40, 40 years ago, um, these sediments were described and there were some strange loading structures described. And that's why we wanted to go and have a look at uh, to see what they might actually represent. Um, before I do that, let's have a look at this area up in the, the upper right, just to give you an idea of, of the resolution as well. This is, these are small pebbles on the, on the beach. And this is the, the landing area, which is just a, a meter in diameter on, on the beach there. And if we go in even closer, we can see that I'm standing right beside the landing strip for, for the drone as well. So that gives you an idea of the kind of resolution that we're dealing with. It's, it's not bad, um, but as I say, once you get down to the 10 meter level, then you can see uh, a lot more detail, but you can identify what the different bits of rubbish are lying around on the, the, the beachhead there. So these are the, the structures that we're looking at. You can see, um, that there's some weird things going on under here. We've got uh, mudstone under here, uh, going along here, and uh, these weird lumpy things cutting down through uh, the, the mudstone down uh, into the lower layers here. Um, so we wanted to have a closer look at that. Now, let's have a closer look at this one and we'll identify some of the structures that we're looking for. If you look along the, the bedding plane of this mudstone, because it is a layered mudstone, you can see that it dips down just where this sandstone has dropped down into it. And that's because there's been a loading event. Something has gone down into the sediment and pushed the mud down, and then it's been filled in with sand. So that's, that's what that structure represents. Now, to me, that's a dinosaur footprint. To a sedimentologist, that's a, it's a loading structure. But um, the loading structures are very big and they're very strange, um, especially in very shallow water uh, lagoonal environments. It's not what you would expect to see. And it's not caused by um, faulting because you wouldn't get these uh, bending on both sides of the structure like this. This is something that's been pressed down into the sediment and then filled in with sand. And this is Paige having a look at these because it takes, it ju just finding these and, 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 and looking at them, it takes a long time to convince yourself exactly what they represent. And if you look around, uh, this area, and we did, we had to look to see how many of these structures and whether any of these structures would show anything clearer than, uh, than that uh, individual one that uh, I just showed you. And the, there is at least one. Um, and if you look along here, you can see this is the, the one that we were just looking at. And uh, there's uh, more structures going down here. And if you look further over to the right here, you can see one that looks a bit strange. It doesn't look quite the same as the, the other ones. And if we go in close to it, you can see um, perhaps that it looks like a three-toed thing. So that's possibly a, a dinosaur footprint, but seeing it side on like that, it's very difficult to tell. So you really need to have a look at it from above. And this is what it looks like from above. Uh, three toes, 
there where the uh, three-toed uh, animal has pushed its foot down into the sediment and the, the clay has um, squished up between the toes to fill it in. And uh, as the animals lifted the footprint foot out of the sediment, it's got filled up with sand um, in, a, in a rather uneven way, which, which you would expect to, to see. In fact, this footprint uh, also has another one uh, to the lower right, this big sandy yellow colored thing in the right here is, is also a footprint, but it's of a, di a different dinosaur. It's a very round shaped footprint, which is reminiscent rather than being of a three-toed dinosaur, but is more reminiscent of a sauropod dinosaur. So we're getting uh, a variety of dinosaurs, not just the large three-toed dinosaurs, but also sauropod dinosaurs as well. And uh, one of the things that we did <clears throat> was uh, Paige had brought along a bunch of cones of different colors. Uh, and we went around the beach, putting these wherever we saw uh, something that looked like a dinosaur footprint. <clears throat> the cones, when they're uh, point, uh, coned up, uh, that meant that we're absolutely 100% sure that these were dinosaur footprints. And if they were coned down, then we weren't 100% uh, sure that these were footprints. So you can see there's a variety of uh, ups and downs, uh, whether we um, accept something as being a dinosaur footprint or not. <clears throat> so we ended up with hundreds of these things. Uh, in fact, I don't think we had enough of these cones to go around the whole beach uh, showing off where these <clears throat> footprints were. And I did a, a drone flight over all of this and photographed them and imaged exactly where all these cones were. So that when we went back and looked at it and analyzed it, we could uh, see if we could see any <clears throat> direction in which these dinosaurs might have been moving. Um, as it was, I don't think <clears throat> we could confidently say um, one way or the other. Uh, while we were there, <clears throat> while we were there looking at all these sediments, we also find a, a bunch of other things as you would expect. It's not just the, the dinosaur footprints that we find. We also found shark spines. There's a nice shark spine there. Uh, we also have this shark's tooth in the upper left uh, and another shark's tooth in the middle bottom. Um, but there was also these strange things like this one up in the, the right hand side in the bottom left, as bottom right, sorry, um, which we think might be scutes of a turtle. So it's not just turtles that we're finding, not just sharks that we're finding, um, uh, but we're also finding dinosaurs as well. And we found one bone which we suspect might be that of a dinosaur, um, but we've uh, taken that to the National Museums to see if we can get that prepared properly uh, to, to get it identified. <clears throat> and also I was very lucky, as you know, I'm very keen as is uh, Kate as well, some of us know Kate uh, from our coprolites. Um, I did find a nice coprolite there as well. So it wasn't just uh, bones and footprints. We also find uh, coprolites as well. So that's a nice uh, coprolite in the bottom left. Now, just to, to emphasize what I was talking about, about how the dinosaur footprint may have produced uh, these structures. There is the uh, footprint coming down onto the sediment surface, the foot going well into the sediment, uh, perhaps up to a meter in depth, because these are big heavy animals. And then as it takes its foot out and the sediment falls down into it, the sand falls down into it, you get these funny lumpy <coughs> structures. And this is what we're seeing these lovely big lumpy structures and the bent down mudstones on the either, on either side. Some of them, uh, the effect of them uh, even goes further down than where the foot went. Um, the footprint probably ended up somewhere down here. Uh, this is about a meter in, in height from there to there. And then there's a little bit of mudstone underneath it, but it's also pinched out a sandstone um, lower down in the sequence as well. So that's been pushed down as well. 
but the, the, the footprint itself probably didn't go any further down uh, than, than the, the bottom of the, the upper sandstone. We did find a, a, a loose dinosaur footprint, which we did not collect for the museum. Uh, we left it on the island. Um, but rather than leave it on the beach, we decided that it was probably best to, to leave it with the, the, the locals so that they have something to be able to teach their children about uh, the heritage, the geological heritage of the area as well. So even though it was the only dinosaur footprint uh, from the island that we found at, at the site that was loose, um, we decided that it was very important to, to leave the islanders with something that uh, the children would be able to um, see and identify as something from the island that showed the dinosaurs were there um, during the Middle Jurassic. Um, so just in case you, you can't see the footprint, the side line hopefully shows where it is. And that's now in the community center uh, there uh, where they have put it on display. Um, and the, the primary school kids go there to, to be taught all about it. Now, um, hopefully to be published very soon, the uh, <coughs> pterosaur from the Isle of Skye um, is just about to be resubmitted with corrections, so it's pretty much been accepted. Um, I won't give you the, the name of it, this is top secret. Um, but it's going to be a Gallic name. <clears throat> and this is uh, a representation of the kind of, dino uh, kind of pterosaur that it is. This is the discovery of the pterosaur. Um, <clears throat> the reason why it's not in good focus is because it was uh, during twilight, so it was very dark at the time, and it was difficult for me to hold my telephone uh, and take a decent photograph at that time of uh, day. Um, <clears throat> the people we see here, this is Dougie Ross, who's the curator of the Staffin Museum, and he's digging up um, the, uh, the pterosaur, which is on this slab here. And this is Steve Bussati from Edinburgh, who, who's obviously very happy that it uh, came out in one piece, and he's got his thumbs up. So that's the, the rock that was taken back, and it was very heavy. And as you can see, um, there's a lot of large wet boulders on the beach and uh, it took about eight people carrying this thing just to get it up the beach and it looked very precarious. Um, I have to say that I wasn't um, uh, lifting it at all <clears throat> because of my bad back of course um, but there was plenty of other people who ended up with bad backs too. <clears throat> the, uh, because it was such a, a beautiful specimen, we decided that uh, it was important that uh, someone, a student had an opportunity to study it as part of a PhD project. And uh, the PhD project we came up with was illuminating um, the dark age of pterosaur evolution, an exceptional skeleton from the middle Jurassic of Skye, Scotland, and uh, Natalia Jalieska. Uh, from uh, who's uh, in Edinburgh has been doing the PhD there and I've been co-supervising along with Steve Versati and, and uh, um, uh, Nick <coughs> from the uh, National Museum of Scotland. This is what it looked like after a small amount of preparation. Uh, it doesn't look like much there, but uh, once we, uh, but we have to also remember that there's, there's not really, the, this is probably the most complete pterosaur ever found in Scotland. And it's, it's very good. Um, we've got most of the, the, the backbone, we've got the, the hips, we've got uh, the limb bones, we've got the skull, uh, we've got the, 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 the legs as well as the, the arms and the finger bones as well. And in fact, uh, you'll see in, in a second, uh, well, we've got the, the tail as well, but we've also got uh, some some beautiful little claws and we've been able to to x-ray uh, the skull and being able to identify the different bones of the skull and the teeth and everything so it's it's absolutely beautifully well preserved and this is uh, an image from the the publication which hopefully will soon be out this is the the skull here we've got the hand of the of the animal we've got some of the the arm bones here uh, we've got the neck bones um, we've got the, the hip bones and the, the tail as well. 
So it's absolutely spectacularly well preserved. Uh, just to, to show you how well preserved it is, this is a close up of the uh, claws as they were being prepared. Um, you can see these are the, um, the claws here and the, the finger bones. Beautifully well preserved. <clears throat> this is a reconstruction showing in blue all the bones that we have uh, preserved in the, um, in fact, it's all, all the ones in white that are the ones that we have preserved of the, of the pterosaur. So there's quite a lot of uh, bones preserved in the pterosaur. So hopefully that'll be out in 2022, uh, fairly early on in the year. Um, it's about to be resubmitted and uh, it's going to be an amazing uh, discovery and hopefully uh, we'll all be able to see it on display in the National Museum at some time in the near future. If not, then I'll try and borrow it from them to put on display in Glasgow as well. So I'd like to also th thank everybody again and hope that you have a T-Rexcellent Christmas and let's hope it's a better year. That's me finished. <laughs>
the vehicle? Uh, sadly, not. It's it's going to be some something else. Uh, I think it's current biology or something. Okay, right. So, we'll, so we're moving moving biological. <laughs> we'll put. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see an announcement sometime through the the society. I'm sure we will. So uh, I'm not, uh, not sure if we're, if we're going to be publishing on the the footprints uh, that are being discovered on uh -huh. <clears throat> on muck, but uh, I'm hoping that the Scottish Journal will be able to do something on that. Um, so uh, Ian uh, was asking, oops, uh, would you see any evidence of the footprint if you excavated one of the sandstone depressions? Uh, possibly. Um, it's difficult to say. It's really only, you only see the, <coughs> sorry, my, my throat's gone completely. Um, you really only see the, the footprints um, in their entirety if the, if the blocks kind of fall off the edge. Mm -hmm. um, and that one where, where, that we gave to the community um, was a, a block that had fallen off and where you could see the, the three toes very clearly. The vast majority of them are just um, deep impressions which you, you can't really tell very much from. Um, we were lucky that one in situ one where you could actually see the, the, the three toes, <clears throat> but we couldn't tell what kind of species it was. Well, uh, uh, yeah, okay. we, we have a, a question from Jason here, who I think is the one you picked up on and said it's a fascinating insight into these. And do you have any further taxonomic information onto the footprints, the size? Are they theropods or ornithopods uh, and so uh, on? So can you glean well, anything from them? Some of them could have been a beastie with three toes like this. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a, a trackway that we, we can see from above um, that's picked out in, 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 the, in a different type of seaweed. And uh, it probably was uh, something akin to one of these. Okay. So we, we, we at least have two different kinds, whether uh, this, this, the three-toed one was an ornithopod or a theropod, we can't say, um, because the, the toes are a wee bit distorted by, um, by the mud and the sand. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, we think that the, the one that was given to the community center probably was an ornithopod rather than a theropod. Okay, uh, so Roger and Helen are, are asking, uh, so the sandstone that fills the footprint above the mudstone, do you know anything, of, uh, can you say anything about its source or depositional environment? What was the, uh, what was the world like that they were stuck <coughs> around in? Um, well, it was a, a lagoon that they were stomping around in. Um, so the, the sediment was relatively wet, which is why they were able to make such deep impressions. Um, the sand probably came in as a, as a kind of a flood event. So the footprints would have been there. And then this flood event came in, uh, bringing in things like uh, the, the shark bones, uh, shark teeth, the coprolite, and the dinosaur bones as well. So it's a kind of a mixing sand that came in. Um, and uh, was deposited afterwards. And it just kind of filled in all these holes uh, that the dinosaurs had left behind. Uh -huh. so, so is that marine flooding? Because it, it, you're uh, getting marine species the, or is it a crevasse clay from a river or something? We're, we're not sure whether it's marine or not. The, the sharks could have been uh, freshwater sharks. Oh, uh -huh. okay. Um, a storm deposit, Neil? Uh, there's... there's there's no evidence of, of it being of it ripping through the, the mud, but it, it's possible that the, the upper layer of the mud was eroded flat and then the, the sand was deposited into uh, the, the lower levels um, that were left behind by the, the, the holes. Um, so uh, it, it could be a storm deposit. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing uh, obvious. Uh, there's no sedimentary structure within uh, the sandstone. So. Uh, it's it's a reasonably thick sandstone with not very much structure in it. So yes, it could mm. well be a storm mm. deposit. Tem Tempestite. Yeah. So well, David, you were you were harking back to the beginning of when we were looking at the history of the society a little bit. So yes. you asked you, what, uh, Do you want to ask this question yourself? Too, uh, yeah, when I saw a spelling yeah. mistake on the first word, I didn't mean ooing. <laughs> <back. laughs> we were ooing. It was all wonderful. <laughs> Um, so your first, I never heard of the word escutcheon before as well, it's a new one on me, but uh, the first badge of the society had Glasgow Geological Society, yet we now call ourselves the Geological Society of Glasgow, uh, uh, and on this one, the, when it changed and why? 
Do you know? Uh, I don't. Um, maybe our historian for the society knows. Does Minor know? Is Minor there? The archivist? Um, she's not the archivist. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Margaret here. Margaret, What's Margaret? Margaret? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Margaret. That's all right. Um, I tried to research uh, when it changed, but I couldn't find anything at all in the minutes. Yeah, because the Edinburgh Society hasn't. It's still the Edinburgh Geological Society. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just get, you know, when I write things down and, and uh, I just keep forgetting which way it is, but I know it's the Geological Society of Glasgow. Anyway, yes. I was interested. There is, a, there is an enormous book that was written in the 50th anniversary year. That's still a very long time ago. Mm. Um, and it may be hidden amongst the pages of that somewhere. So uh, mm. it's, it's, bending, it's bending one of my bookshelves at the moment down a bit. So I'll, I'll take it off to give the shelf a bit of relief. Uh, my second follow-up question was about Natalia, you mentioned doing the PhD. I know oh, when yes. Steve Brissati uh, came in in a talk for us, he said he would line up some of his PhD students because it would be good for them to do some outreach. So, uh, Oh, um, absolutely. I think it would be great to have Natalia, especially after so, the, the paper has been published. Yes, yeah, so um, if you can talk to Ian Miller, the new meeting secretary, and maybe get, give him some contact information. We can get, get yep. Natalia lined up for an early talk next year, get it fresh, yeah? Yep. Well, one, one other thing about the uh, society's name, uh, it's interesting that uh, it's the Edinburgh Geological Society and the university there is called Edinburgh University, whereas Glasgow is called the University of Glasgow. So the Geological Society of Glasgow. So it may have been something along the lines of uh, the same time as the university changed to be, being the University of Glasgow rather than Glasgow University. Just a thought. Okay. That sounds reasonable. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, let's go back to some technical questions then. So, oh dear, Rich was asking. So we could see layers of sedimentary rocks in the foreground, in front of oh. high ground in the mid distance. What are, what's the age range of these rocks, and what's the relationship between uh, <coughs> the, the the higher and the lower parts of the sequence, presumably? Uh, the sediments were all Bathonian. So we're talking about 170 million years old, um, plus or minus a couple of million. So uh, the full range probably is less than a million years. Okay. Um, so Ma Matthew, uh, I'll get him to ask this himself, but I just want to intervene and say that he's, uh, there's a wonderful word that he may have invented in here. I don't know, dinotation. Oh, <laughs> oh no, it's a real word. <laughs> I think that literally means terrible disturbance or frightening disturbance, but anyway. <laughs> so Matthew, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Yeah, um, just so we'll go and read it out. Yeah, great talk, Nelly. I just was going to ask about the dino turbation or the, and how do you go about actually determining uh, dino turbation or, you know, a f dinosaur footprint from you know, a very just a unusual sedimentary loading structure, you know, is it, is it the depth or is there particular, uh, you know, characteristics you're looking for? And also, uh, the, uh, yeah. Sorry, on you yeah, go. Sorry. No, uh, yeah, and just to follow up on the storm deposit idea, how can, how, is there any other evidence you've got to kind of back up the dinosaur kind of idea? I, I guess with the, these, if it was a storm deposit, you know, it, it, are we just looking at very unusual sedimentology or you know how, how do we confirm it as a dinosaur kind of thing um yeah and I, I got another question on the populations between the Hebridean and the Murray Basin and have you got any initial thoughts on uh what what are the similar dinosaur species represented in both basins yeah uh well there's only one locality where the dinosaur remains are found on <clears throat> in the Murray uh, Firth Basin. And as far as I've been able to work out, we've got sauropod and theropod, but uh, that's as far as we can go. With dinosaur footprints, it's not quite like ornithology where you can see a footprint of something and identify which bird it came from. Uh, although birds and dinosaurs are basically the same, we haven't got to the stage where we can identify which dinosaur made what footprint. Um, so all we can say is the, the main groups. So we've got theropod and sauropod in um, 
uh, the Murray uh, Firth Basin, and we also have theropod and sauropod in the Hebrides Basin, uh, all round about the same age. I mean, they're all Bathonian in, in age, which is which is interesting. Um, but it's the the age is more to do with the sedimentary environment that was around at that time in that area. Um, so um, that's that's about all we can say with that. Uh, in terms of the identifying the the sedimentary structure against uh, dinoturbation, um, the 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 giveaway for us was that we were able to see a dinosaur footprint. Um, that helped. Um, we, we could actually see the shape of the dinosaur footprint, the, the three toes uh, there. Um, we've also been able to see uh, or distinguish uh, toe impressions on sauropod or what we think were sauropod footprints as well. So uh, we, we have been able to kind of extend it a little bit further and say, yes, there are definitely uh, uh, dinosaur footprints. There's definitely dinoturbation, but we can't say that every single one of the structures that we were looking at are definitely dinosaur footprints. All we can say is that they show similar structures, similar bending or or downturning of the, the clay or the mudstone layers uh, at the side of these uh, um, sandstone or sedimentary structures um, that does suggest that something had pushed down through the, the, the mudstones uh, to produce those structures. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, storm deposits, the sandstones are not just uh, devoid of sedimentary structures. They've also got all these um, uh, shark teeth uh, and bones of all sorts, all scattered throughout. They're, they're not in layers. They're all kind of lumped together in all kinds of orientations. So there's no... Uh, uh, they, they themselves haven't got any sedimentary structures, which is one way of, of determining that something is, is, a, is a rapidly deposited uh, sandstone. That's, that's, that's about all we can say about it. Uh, as, at, at the moment, we do have uh, um, a sedimentologist working with us on the structures, so hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to hear uh, more precisely from him whether there's any other descriptions of sedimentary structures that would explain these other than dinosaur footprints. But we're, we're, we're about 99.999% confident that uh, we do have dinosaurs here. Okay, thank you. Sounds really good. Neil, can you turn off your screen share? Oh, yep, sure. Um, stop share. Here we go. Ah, goodness. Now you can see everyone. <laughs> Can it's I just, just, I know um, Rick Ar Rich Arthur wants to say something. Can I just jump in before that about the pop about follow up to Matthew's question, which was about the different populations in the Hebridean and Moray Basin. I know you showed a map of the paleogeography of the Bathonian in your talk with this sort of Scottish high separating the basins. I went to a talk at the Edinburgh Society a couple of weeks ago from Mark Wilkinson, where there's sort of certainly a view that the Scottish Highlands weren't islands they were certainly covered in the jurassic seas and they may have these dinosaurs may have stomped all over it's just been uplifted and eroded do you see any population changes because that would be an interesting part of that argument i don't think we've found enough in the murray basin to say very much about them at least in the hebridean basin we do have bones so we, we can identify what kind of animals were there um, in the uh, murray first basin um, we can only just say that there's sauropods and theropods. That's all we can say about it. <clears throat> Whether there was any communication between them, we don't know. Um, we, we also have very similar um, dinosaur populations uh, down in the Cleveland Basin as well. So it, it would suggest that there's even uh, communication between the Cleveland uh, Basin, uh, the Murray Firth Basin and the Hebridean Basin. And I would even go further than that because I, I wrote a few papers about Wyoming as well, uh, not just to get a trip out to Wyoming. Um, but uh, when I was out in Wyoming, I looked at the footprints there and I compared them uh, with the dinosaur footprints that we get from Sky. And uh, you just wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, so, and they are of the same age as well. So the possibility is that the, these dinosaurs were very wide ranging. They, they, had, they did have populations uh, of very similar dinosaurs uh, covering 
um, quite a lot of uh, uh, land mass. Uh, about the, the Hebrides Basin and the Murray Firth Basin, I think that uh, at the time these dinosaurs were walking around, I think they, they were highs, um, they, they probably were hills between the, the two basins, uh, and a lot of the sediment was uh, flowing off uh, these into, into the basins in, in the two different directions. Um, uh, they, they certainly weren't covered in Jurassic seas <clears throat> at the time the dinosaurs were stomping around in the, in the two basins. Um, um, otherwise, they wouldn't have anywhere to go to, to, <clears throat> to, to feed and, and, and stay out of the water. Okay, uh, so Rich, Arthur's come back and first of all makes a diversion into the names again and points out that some universities have changed their name like Bristol and changed the words. <laughs> I seem to remember that Glasgow, uh, when I was working there in the 80s, was called the, the University Glasgow. Um, but the new kids on the block rather took umbrage to that. So I think that uh, the name had to be changed to recognise that there were other institutions coming around. Um, one of which had been there a long time anyway. Um, but then uh, we have a, so then, then the question, which it kind of extends the, the basin picture, is that there's a big unconformity in the West Mendips with the Jurassic Sea inundating over and Veriscan fold belt. Um, so is this big transgression event in the Jurassic recognised in the, in the Scottish and the Hebridean basins, and maybe the Murray Basin? Uh, well, cer certainly the um, the Middle Jurassic that I'm working on with the <coughs> um, in the Bethonian, um, it's very shallow water, um, lagoonal environments and rivers and, and all sorts. <coughs> but um, uh, from the Kimmeridgian uh, up through the uh, up beyond that, uh, it does go uh, become marine. So there there is a transgression. Um, uh, from the in the Cameridian, probably for uh, dating from the the Oxford clay upwards, this is a slight trans, uh, transgression. Oh. Come, my voice is going really bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, before it, it goes all together, do we have any any final questions? There's nothing else coming up on the chat. Uh, I was just going to ask finally: uh, Are you going back? And is there more to do? Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I love the Isle of Muck, and uh, I would love to go back there. Um, I don't think I would have to go back there to do uh, much more in terms of the study of the, the dinosaur footprints. I think we've been able to, to get as, as much data as, as we need um, to, to say that they, they are there. Um, but uh, Muck is such a lovely place. I'd love to, to do some drone flying over the, the old village and take images of the old village because uh, that's a fascinating place as well. Um, but I, I think that uh, drone flying over the rest of the, the geology would be something that would be worth doing as well. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand, you, hand over to Walter now to say some words uh, uh, after your talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Just, just two preliminary points. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, when I was looking at the Falls of Clyde on the on the uh, the emblem, it occurred to me that that must be before the hydroelectric works in the nineteen twenties. So it's a kind of a unique record as well. <laughs> Although, of course, uh, sometimes they they do let the falls flow at their full rate. The second thing was that the book you referred to that you've got, Simon, is in the library, and I will have a look at it <laughs> uh, just to see if I can. Uh, get any information about the name. Anyway, so far as the talk is concerned, I mean, I think that the, the chat and the questions show how much uh, it has really been uh, enjoyed. Uh, there, were, there are two big points come out for me. Uh, well, at least two anyway. The, the first is um, the, zo the possibilities that are given by this zone technology. It's quite clearly another another dimension in in, in what is possible. Uh, I was going to say that it was almost like uh, a, a field trip, uh, but it was actually better than a field trip because we got all sorts of angles that we wouldn't have got on a field trip. 
Uh, so that, that's really quite astonishing. And, and I think I'm very grateful to uh, Neil for showing us all that because it's, it's been a, a, a revelation. Uh, the second thing uh, uh, is that uh, I, I was so impressed by the fact that here we saw this, this uh, mudstone, in, which was in this uh, strange formation, and it had been identified as um, an unusual load. So that translates to um, a dinosaur footprint without any obvious sign of it being a dinosaur footprint until it was examined in, in more detail. And I, mean, I, I find that really, really astonishing and, and marvelous. A tribute to the people that were there. And the, f the final point, which is perhaps the most important uh, point of all, and that is that we have been really treated uh, to a lecture tonight by somebody who is clearly uh, one of the foremost experts in the subject that he was dealing with. I, I found that his knowledge uh, 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 of the, the subject was, was just uh, quite remarkable, and the way in which he was uh, put it across uh, was so interesting, and as I say, that was reflected in the in the uh, compliments and, uh, and in the questions uh, that that were raised. So I'm sure you would all want me to thank uh, Neil very very warmly for his uh, for his really marvelous lecture, which I think we've we've all loved. I'm not quite sure of how how we we show that, but I suspect the easiest way is just just to uh, clap our hands in the image. That we have of of ourselves. Thank you very much, Neil.